Well, hi folks, and welcome to the first video in the uh, Mysteries of the Cathar Country series. Uh, this is the Knights Templar, and it, I've called it the Knights Templar, the Conspirators, because um, uh, that's what we'll look at, and then we'll do further videos uh, covering different aspects of the Templars later on. Now, it's important to remember that uh, my idea of the Cathars and the research that I did was based on the Languedoc, the Languedoc area of southern France, uh, where the Cathars were based. So I've come at it as a kind of a uh, that sort of uh, angle, if you see what I mean. Now, the important thing to remember as well is that the Knights Templar actually considered the Languedoc as a possible area, the Cathar country, as a possible area as a, of a homeland for themselves. So um, this is why it became an important aspect for me to cover and to put in the book. Now, the leading families down there in the Cathar country uh, of the 12th to the 14th century had very strong uh, Cathar connections and also Knights nice Templar connections. Uh, in fact, um, a lot of the, the, if you study that sort of area, you realise that a lot of the um, the leading families, uh, or the, the different towns had, had leading families that were connected and that uh, ruled those particular areas. Uh, like a lot of them were called Raymond, like it was Raymond Trencavel, Raymond of Toulouse, blah, 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 as you go through, and, uh, and Ren Le Chateau, which is just a, t a small uh, hamlet. Uh, had their own reading, leading family as well, and that was the Hatpool Blanchefort. And that small area itself, which is, of course is a massive area of study in, in, in my book, and the reason for going down to the, to the land dock in the first place, but it's also um, a fact that they provided a, a Grand Master to the Knights Templar. So it, that, it's a very, very important uh, aspect of the story. Now, the idea, what we, what we want to uh, focus on is who were these uh, famous warrior monks that everybody seems to be interested in, but nobody really looks into the background of where they actually came from. So the formation of Knights Templar, it is shrouded in mystery, it really is, and it's probably shrouded also in, in misinformation. Uh, academia, as in so many subjects, has accepted the earliest accounts of the Templars and um, reputations have been built, uh, PhDs have been written, people have had positions in, in universities uh, talking about this aspect of history. And it's never really, uh, it can't be um, challenged because these people have got their reputations based on these, on these subjects, as in so many other aspects of history. And not only that, but if the earlier accounts, the earliest accounts came from a source that had something to hide, then there may be a much more intriguing truth lying behind the whole story. So enter onto our stage, Guillaume de Tyre. Now he was a, Frank, a Frankish historian and he was also the Archbishop of Tyre. And Tyre was a small uh, community uh, on the, the town, in a town in Lebanon. And he provided the first accounts of the Knights Templar. And that was between 1175 uh, and 1185. So it was a 10 year period. Uh, but that was written 50 years after the actual events. So it's not clear where he sourced his information. It's probable that he got the information from the Templars themselves. So he would have had information from the source. So all he would have had was information that they wanted him to reproduce. So these accounts uh, of the early days have been adopted uh, as the future for historians as a fact, okay? But I think it's prudent to look at Detaille's work and use it only really as a framework, um, a foundation to build on and to perhaps complete the story with uh, more information that has since then become available. And that's what I'm going to try and do. Moreover, Detaille, uh, he would have used the only information 
apart from the Templars' first hand account uh, that was available, and that came from a chronic, 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 a chron, uh, chron, the chronicles <laughs> of uh, Fulcher of Chartres. Now, uh, he was born in Chartres in 1059, okay, and uh, as such, he would have been a contemporary f at the f of the formation of the Templars, okay. Now, this was after the conquest of Jerusalem in 1099, okay. Now, Ful Fulker, Fulcher had travelled to the, the Holy Land with Bol uh, Baldwin of Boulogne, who became the future king. Uh, and he acted as his chaplain and, he, and his chronicler, and he made three big, uh, thick books, accounts of the time, uh, of his times down in, in, the, uh, in the Holy Land. The first book being the uh, leading up to the Crusades uh, of 1095, then the conquest of Jerusalem, uh, and the establishment of uh, Geoffrey of, Bull of Bullion as the first ruler. Um, then there was the second ruler, uh, Baldwin the first, uh, the king from uh, 1100 to 1118, and thirdly Baldwin the second up to 1127. So that that covered the whole area of his three volumes, and then of course he Fulcher went off the off the scene because there was a plague that took over Jerusalem um, at that time. So obviously he's thought that Fulcher died of the of the plague although we don't really definitely know but he, all we know is that he stopped writing at that particular time but the interesting and very more important thing about this is that throughout Fulcher's work from his first hand knowledge of the Holy Land he never once mentioned the Knights Templar so the idea that the Templars were there in the Holy Land for um, protecting um, the roads and protecting the pilgrims and were foremost uh, in the in this in this area it, it brings it into doubt doesn't it because not once was he meant was he mentioned by the official chronicler so again who uh, so uh, Guillaume de Taille, uh, the Templars f uh, said that the Templars were formed okay by Hugh de Payon a vassal of the Count of Champagne and this was done in 1118, and he had said that it was to protect the, the, the pilgrims travelling to the Holy Land. And that they were, the Templars on arrival were granted um, audience with King Baldwin of Jerusalem, as he then became, who awarded them a place uh, as part of his palace. And the area he was given was the area that, that they were given to live in and to occupy, was the area above uh, Solomon's Temple. So it's on the ruins of Solomon's, Solomon's Temple. And that was, the, that was uh, still part of the Royal Palace, but they were given their own area in the Royal Palace. So they must have had some incredible connections just to turn up and be given that. Now, Detaya tells how the Templars kept their number to nine for the first nine years uh, of their time in the Holy Land. And they, and they spent the, that time traveling around protecting uh, Otremer, or as they called it, which was the land uh, over the seas, or the Holy Land as we now call it. But the, and the order then was known as the Knights of the Christ, uh, the Poor Knights of Christ and the Temple of Solomon, which of course eventually was, was uh, narrowed down to the Knights Templar. But Detaille wrote, as we said, 50 years after the events and gained information directly from the Templars. So he's doubtful, and he's doubtful as well, of how much now Knights would have, how, how much effect they would have protecting a land the size of Wales. So who were these Knights? Enter stage left, or seconds performer, Bernard of Clavaux. Now this is, he was born Bernard de Fontaine uh, and he was, he was part of the nobility of Burgundy and he was one of the sons of the Lord Fontaines and Aleth of Montbard. Now Bernard joined the Cistercian order in uh, 11, 
1912, and this was only just about 11 years after the Cistercians had, uh, had been developed. And then pretty much straight after uh, Bernard joined the Cistercian order, he was followed by more than 30 of his close relatives and friends. And this nearly doubled the size of the Cistercian order. So, I mean, this looks like a power grab, doesn't it? Because now he, he joined the order and now he's got nearly half of the people uh, in the order, uh, his friends and family. Looks like a real power grab to me. And that'll become uh, an interesting factor as we carry on. Anyway, in 1115, uh, Bernard travelled to the Val de Absinthe. Uh, now that's uh, 40 miles south east of Troy and Troy or Troy as it is in French it's spelled Troy so that's, what, that's the word we'll use um, that's uh, 40 miles south of Troy which was the, the heart of uh, the Champagne district okay now he took with him 12 monks and he found a little bit of land in the Val de, Abs the Val de Absinthe and he he founded an abbey okay now, he founded the Abbey in, on the 25th of June in 1115, and uh, it's, he called it the Valley of Light, or Clairvaux. Uh, and it's from this base that the Abbot of Clairvaux became highly influential in a massive expansion of the Cistercians. The Cistercians, Cistercians uh, from there just uh, uh, ballooned all over Europe. I went to actually uh, a few years ago to look at the Abbey, the Abbey remains, but it's actually turned into a high security prison, which str struck me as being um, uh, strange or uh, um, in itself. But uh, So I didn't have no photographs of it because I didn't really think it would be a good idea to stand taking photographs of a high security prison. But anyway, ironic is the word I was thinking, really I, I, an irony that I'm sure Bernard of Galore would uh, find amusing. Anyway, Bernard had massive family connections uh, and, the, and the land that he built his abbey on was actually gifted to him by uh, the Count of Champagne. Now, the Count of Champagne had massive uh, areas uh, that he owned on a really huge area uh, east of Paris. Uh, this is an area now that you can still visit. This, this is what we know as the Champagne region now. And, and anybody who's been there knows that you can drive for miles and miles and miles and all you see is vineyards and flat land. Uh, now this was the area owned by the Count of Champagne. Now Hugh de Payen, the first grand master, was a vassal of the Count of Champagne. Uh, as were at least two of his companions. And also, uh, they were neighbours and they were relatives. And one of the original knights, André de Montbard, was Byrne's uncle. So let's invite onto stage our next conspirator, Hugh I, Count of, Count of Champagne, 1074 to 1125, uh, and he was Count from 1193. Now, Hugh de Champagne was one of the most powerful men in France. His godfather was no other than uh, King Philip I of France. And his, fam his family was linked to uh, many, many powerhouses throughout Europe, including the French uh, and Scottish St. Clairs, uh, the Dukes of Burgundy and Normandy, uh, and the Plantagenet kings of England. At least he's one powerful, powerful guy. And his capital was uh, in the Champagne region, and as we said, there was the city of Troy, or Troyes, as the French pronounce it. And this became an exoteric and philosoph uh, philosophical um, area of, and, Kabbal and an area of Kabbalistic teaching. And it, it, uh, and a, a huge Jewish population grew there, which is also an interesting fact and part of our story. Uh, there's great similarities there, again, between that what happened there and, uh, and the lands in the Longadoc. For example, uh, the area that we stay, 
when we go on our Cathar tour is uh, in Al Liban in uh, Le, uh, the Hostile Le Viché. Now Le Viché is the old bishop's palace, and even in the little town, the little wall, walled town, there's the area where Nostradamus uh, used to, the house where uh, Nostradamus used to live, and it seems like that area it was an area of uh, Jewish. Um, Kabbalistic and philosophical teaching and it, it's actually known that the area was a safe place for people who wanted to study that uh, any sort of philosophical tradition um, as, and the Cathars were basically um, they were free and they were open people to study their own particular religion uh, now anyway ten years um, after Hugh de Champagne uh, went off to the Holy Land, which he did, he joined the Knights Templars in 1124, and then he returned, returned back to Troyes, and immediately then, that was when he donated the land to Bernard of Claveau. These are all, these uh, questions start in your mind, don't they? Why, why did he do that? Why did he join the Knights Templar? And why did he give the land when he, when he returned? So now we'll talk about uh, the Council of Troy, okay? Because it was on the f it was four years later, uh, so just after he so not for long after he'd um, Hugh de Champagne had given the lands to Bernard of Law to build his abbey, that there was a council, uh, and it started on the fourteenth of January, eleven twenty eight. So the Council of Troyes or Troy was held in the Count of Champagne's court. And it was attended by leading uh, European churchmen and noblemen from, a, uh, and from a, across Europe and uh, definitely from every area of France. But from the beginning of this, um, uh, of this uh, council, it was obvious that it was going to be the Bernard of Claveau show and that he had one point on his agenda. And this was to bring uh, the Templars and to legitimise the order by bringing them under uh, the cover of the French church, right into the body of the church. Now it was said that uh, uh, Hugh uh, was one of the most powerful men in Europe with blood ties uh, to the King of Jerusalem and the Templars and the Pope uh, could not afford, really, because of the power of, of Hugh and his, and his courtiers and friends, they couldn't afford not to take him well, really seriously. And uh, Bernard uh, had been working hard, uh, Bernard of Clovis had been working hard in the background to uh, change the rule of St. Benedict so that the Cistercians could adopt this and also the Knights Templar, bringing them together under, under, the church, under the church's rule or umbrella. So two weeks into uh, the council, this is on the 31st of January, 1128, Hugh de Champagne, the Grand Master of the Knights Templar, together with his colleagues, received their, whole, their new holy rule, uh, which obviously was prepared by Bernard of Claveau. So then there were officially, from that point, uh, there were an official order of the Church of Rome. Pope Honorius II, who was the, the, the Pope at the time, uh, had obviously found the... Well, I'm thinking that he was in a situation there where um, he had the chance of taking this powerful uh, band of... Uh, growing band of fighting monks under his umbrella. So he had two choices, didn't he? He either got into the, the situation where these could have, uh, this powerful order with powerful families of noblemen throughout the country could one day turn on him, uh, become his enemies, or he could bring them under the church and control them himself. Uh, so keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. So from that point on, the Knights Templar were a Catholic or a, 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 an order of the Church of Rome. Now, Bernard of Claveau had obviously done a really good job. First, he, 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 he 
he got in, he made himself the leader of the Cistercians, and now the fighting arm of the same group of families had become part of the church. And in time and time and time again, this uh, it was shown that Bernard of Claveau was uh, a master political order, um, uh, master political actor, sorry. And in 1139, Pope Innocent II issued the Omni Datum Optimum, which is a papal bull, making the, the Templars answerable only to the Pope. And this gave them a free hand, basically, to do whatever they want, whenever they wanted to do it, without having to pay taxes or tithes, or even follow the laws of the land. This was a power grab indeed by these uh, connected families. So who were these families? So let's welcome onto the stage the Rex Deus families. Now this massively um, powerful group of interlocked families, um, for, the, for the work on this we need to mention uh, uh, Marilyn Hopkins, Graham and Simmons and Tim Wallace Murphy. Tim Wallace Murphy was big in, in studying this uh, Rex Deus lineage after meeting Andrew Sinclair down in Rosslyn. And, and Tim actually lives down in the Longer Dock and uh, he, he's got a massive interest and well, I'll talk about his books in, in the book review which we'll do after this video. Uh, now, he uncovered this lineage of families called the Rex Deus. Uh, now, their claim, the Rex Deus families, claim to be the descendants of the, the select high priests in the Temple of Jerusalem. And these families are supposed to have gone right down uh, to this day, but they stem from the immediate descendants of Jesus. Now, they're said to have an a incredible secret that they... That they uh, they keep within the family, and the family keeps takes, uh, as the lineage as the family lineage goes down through the years. They hold this uh, secret knowledge. During the Dark Ages, the families uh, blended into cultures. Okay, uh, as they spread out, there's the family spread out through the world. They blend into the areas that uh, they moved into, and they would become part of the, the religion of the area. Does this ring a bell in any way? Um, because at the time, the, uh, the Catholic Church, um, the heresy laws were so strict that anybody who was working outside that area just had to be very careful. So over the centuries, the Rex Day's families remained out of sight. They established themselves within the upper echelons of the societies that they adopted. They, had a, they have illustrious names, such as the Sinclairs of Rosslyn, the Leslie clan, the Saxon dynasty, the Counts of Champagne, and amazingly, the Habsburgs of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. These were powerful, powerful people. In fact, Maximilian I, who was the first Holy Roman Empire, um, and he was a Habsburg, his tomb, when he died, he displayed 40 life-size um, statues of members of the, of the Rex Deus families, including the Merovingian uh, King Clovis, Godfrey de Bullion, Queen Elizabeth of Hungary, King Ferdinand of Aragon, Philip Duke of Burgundy, the Archduke uh, Sigismund, and the Duchess Mary of Burgundy. If any proof was, more proof was needed, there it is. So anyway, way back in the, the Solomon, times of Solomon's temple, the high priestess of the Rex Deus, they were in, their job was to ensure the line, uh, of the royal continuance of the, of the continuance of the royal line. And they would do this by impregnating uh, the females of uh, the royal lineage, and then they would be married off. To a, to a member of the royal, to the member of the royalty, and then any children that came from that marriage would be put into the temple school to continue the uh, not only the royal lineage but the royal te uh, the teachings associated with it. The fate of one of these girls, or oh, this is the story, 
uh, gives us an insight, not into our understand, not only into our understanding of how these role lineages worked, but also how we interpret the Bible. The girl is known in history as Mary. She was impregnated by a high priestess of the Rex Deus lineage called Gabriel, because the the the, uh, the high priest kept uh, names such as the angel names and so on. She was then married off to a line uh, of the uh, the royalty called uh, uh, Joseph of Tyre, uh, and he was a direct descendant of Hiram of Biff. And anybody know who studied Temple uh, makes Masonic history, or as a Mason himself will know that Hiram of Biff is a very very important um, aspect of the Temple history, as he was involved in the building of Solomon's temple. Anyway, uh, the husband of uh, Mary now is known to us as Saint Joseph. The child to us is known as Jesus. And as we know, Jesus was put back into the temple school uh, to be educated at the age of seven. So. All this information in this video basically has served to give us a backdrop of the people involved, the conspirators involved in our story of the Knights Templar. So what we're going to do from from here on, uh, the next, I'll, I'll probably do an, a book review next, so we can have a, I'll put a list of all the books uh, connected with the Templars beneath uh, in the description below. Okay, so if you want one, just click on it and you can get yourself a copy. But the next in the series uh, of the Templars we're going to call The Formation of a Brotherhood. That's the next video. Um, so please, if you haven't subscribed to this video, to, the, to this channel, please do click on subscribe. <coughs> excuse me, on the bell above to be told about the next videos that come along. And please do put a, 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 dis, uh, a comment below because maybe well, I'm hoping this will become a little bit of a community so it's not just me talking to you we can talk backwards and forwards like I said, and as I say below in the description that you can buy my book you can buy the other books and there's also my um, link to my PayPal account uh, I'm doing this full time so any help uh, I get will be gratefully received and I will see you all in the next video